Sirens by Timothy Manning. The steam from the boiling pot had already frozen to the window, rendering the pane opaque with the spider crack layer of frost. Using the heel of her palm, Clara cleared a tiny porthole in the film and peered outside. The storm had arrived early, and angry black clouds canopied the sky, bathing the landscape in thick shadow. Wind-whipped snow piled in fluffy migrating mounds on their abbreviated front lawn, and bluish luminance cast by the front floodlight caught the twinkle of a million star-like flakes. The trees, burdened with the extra weight, bowed further over the pitch-black void that marked their driveway. I sure hope he gets home soon, Clara thought, as she returned her attention to dinner. Mitch worked long hours at the shop, and on some nights he wouldn't arrive home until after midnight. Five miles of narrow, meandering back roads stretched between their home and town, roads that became deadly in bad weather. What if he can't make it home tonight? Just the thought caused her gut to clench in anxiety. If he didn't come home, she would be left alone with them. Moving silently on slippered feet, Clara entered the den, folded her short frame into the sofa, and cracked open a well-worn novel. As her glance skipped distractedly from word to word, she realized that the innocuous romance would do little to assuage her frazzled nerves. Closing the volume with a clap, she called for Jed to join her. With a short yip and a wag of his bushy tail, the retriever leapt onto the couch beside her. A thin smile creasing her face, Clara scratched his belly. Jed kicked his leg in approval. At least the wind should drown out their cries, she reasoned. They always came at night, fleeting female forms that hugged the forest's tangled limits, emerging from the shadows for a glimpse before fading out of sight. Pale, lithe, and naked, they called to her, shrieking and howling like tortured sirens. They never left the woods or set foot in the lawn, and Clara had believed that it was the home's floodlights that kept them at bay. She had seen a wraith her first night alone in Mitch's secluded cabin. Terrified, she'd called him home from work and had endured his cruel jeers when he searched the woods and found nothing. Since then, their appearances had grown more frequent and intense, and their numbers had doubled. At home, alone, she often cried herself to sleep as their wails echoed through the cabin. The wind howled in a potent basso like breath through a bottleneck, slapping the windows and rattling the cabin's aged frame. Looks like it's just going to be you and me again, she said to Jed. She found the sound of a voice, even her own, soothing. The lights flickered twice and went out. Oh, God, no, Clara said as she huddled in the dark. Tears flowing freely down her cheeks, she fixated on the floor lamp as she waited for it to turn back on. The darkness amplified innocent sounds, rendered them frightening, threatening even. The rattle of the window glass, the creak of floorboards, the rhythmic scrape of a low-hanging bough on the cabin's roof, all were infused with insidious meaning. Miraculously, one sound managed to rise above the cacophony. A woman's tortured scream. They had returned, and without the lights to ward them off, they would come for her. Overcoming her initial shock, Clara sprung from the sofa and raced from room to room as she checked each window and door to be certain they were locked. Satisfied that nothing corporal could gain entrance, she returned to the den where she added another log to the simmering fire. As the flame blazed, the ruddy, flickering light cast long shadows that ebbed and waved in fitful starts with each crackle. Clara eyed the phone. Would he believe her this time, or chastise her for her overactive imagination? She knew that Mitch kept a backup generator in his workshop, but she had no idea how to work it. Besides, the workshop stood a long walk from the house, and she certainly wasn't going to chance stepping outside. With the frantic click of nails on hardwood, Jed bolted from her side and nearly slid into the end table as he stiffened his legs to stop. Hackles raised, teeth bared, Jed growled as he faced the front door. Hands slick with sweat, Clara snatched up a poker from the hearth and crept across the room. Cocking her weapon back, she approached the window, slipped her thin fingers between the gap in the curtains, and plucked them open. The fire's reflection quavered in the window's glass, making it difficult for her to see outside. Breath stuck in her lungs, Clara leaned forward and pressed her nose to the glass. It sprung up in front of her, its hideous face inches from her own. With a scream, Clara stumbled back, the poker slipping from her grip as she landed hard on her backside. Eyes transfixed on the figure, she drove her heels into the floor as she propelled herself away from the window and behind the sofa. Pressing her spindly fingers on the glass, the wraith jerked her head from right to left as she glared into the den. Snow-clumped raven locks dangled in slick tendrils around her lithe face, and her thin blue lips contrasted with her ivory skin. Eyes bulging from their puffy, purplish sockets, the wraith screamed in frustration. Blood, thick and bright, dribbled from her mouth, stippling her bare chest with crimson. "'Leave me alone!' Clara shouted back. She realized her mistake immediately. Hearing the noise, the creature slapped her palms against the glass as she warbled. 
foamy pink spittle sprayed the window, only to be smeared beneath her flailing hands. Jed growled viciously as he leapt at the window. Gouging the wood sill with his claws, he snapped at the apparition. In a blink, the wraith disappeared. Only the dissipating condensation from her hot breath remained as evidence of her appearance. Good boy, Clara managed as she stood. Hot urine soaked her jeans from groin to knee. Jed ignored her praise. Moving to the front door, he scratched the floorboards as he sniffed at the seam between the door and the jam. Come on, Jed, she's gone. The knob jiggled and Jed resumed his litany of barks. No longer caring if Mitch got upset, Clara snatched the phone from the cradle. Jabbing at the button, she dialed the garage. One ring. Two rings. Yeah? Ned's deep, gruff voice was unmistakable. Hey, Ned, this is Clara. Well, hello there, Clara. What's up? You spooked again? Clara ignored his remark. Listen, is Mitch still there? You kidding me, Mitch? It's after five. He left over an hour ago. He did? Yep. Though he probably got caught in this storm. You know it's really coming down out there. A gust of wind slammed into the front of the house with enough force to rattle the pictures on the walls. The connection crackled. All right. Thanks, Ned. She didn't wait for his reply as she lowered the phone. Jed had moved again. He now focused his attention on the west side of the cabin. A shadow passed by a curtained window. Whomever or whatever lurked outside was circling the house. Clara whimpered as she realized that it was searching for a way in. Acting before fear paralyzed her brain, Clara dialed 911. Mitch would be furious, but she didn't care. Blaine County Sheriff's Office, said the nasally voice. Hello? I am alone, and someone is trying to break into my house. She spoke slowly as she struggled to keep calm. Okay, ma'am, if you could just give me your address, we'll send an officer out right away. Thank you, she thought. Jed had finally stopped barking. It's, from outside, a thunderous crack as a tree split. Hello? She yelled into the receiver. A loud pop, white noise, then nothing. Oh, God, no! She whined as she let the phone tumble from her hands. The fire flickered as a frigid draft blew through the living room. Pulling her sweatshirt tightly around her, Clara hustled to the kitchen. One thing was for certain. She would need a better weapon to defend herself. Jed, she called as she rounded the doorway. Jed didn't come. Hey, boy. Pausing in the doorway, Clara stared into the shadows. Where did he go? Another draft, stronger this time, flipped the curtains beside her, offering her a brief glimpse outside. Clara steadied herself against a table to keep from collapsing. No, she whispered as she tore the curtains open. She hadn't been wrong. The storm doors leading to the cellar stood wide open. Jed, she shouted as she stumbled into the kitchen. The wraith stood at the top of the staircase its bone-white body seemingly aglow against the shadowy backdrop of the stairwell. Thick, blood-encrusted scratches cross-hatched her gangly frame. Jed lie on the floor beside her, the dented can of soup beside his head telling all. Bloodshot eyes glistening with lunacy, the woman opened her mouth and cackled. Inside her mouth, the jagged stump of her severed tongue waggled. Taking an unsteady step forward, she reached for Clara. Wheeling, Clara fled. With the flip-flop of half-frozen feet, the wraith pursued. Dodging the sofa, Clara slid to the door. Even as her body collided with the wall, her fingers worked at the locks. Turning the knob, she chanced a glance behind her. Bow-legged and slow, the woman limped through the kitchen doorway. Recognizing Clara's imminent escape, she raised her hands and shrieked in protest. Without a second glance, Clara stepped out into the storm. She didn't know where she would go, and she didn't care. Wading through the knee-high drifts, she pushed toward the driveway. Driven by harsh winds, the snow peppered her bare face and clotted in her loose ponytail. After a few steps, her slippers grew heavy and cumbersome with packed snow. Blinded by the blizzard-like snowfall, she meandered down the driveway. Ahead, a silhouetted figure stood in her path. Clara tried to stop, but tripped on a semi-submerged branch. Landing face first in a drift, she fought to stand. Clara? Mitch? She burst into tears of relief. What the hell is going on? he asked as he ran to help her. Dropping the shovel he carried, he reached down and hefted Clara to her feet. Mitch, where's your truck? I got stuck by the workshop. I was just going to dig it out. Claire, why are you out here? Her jaw trembled from a combination of cold and emotion. One of those things I told you about, she explained. It broke into the house. It was trying to kill me. Mitch's hard, scruffy features softened in genuine concern. How did it get in? Through the basement. The doors must have been unlocked. Mitch, I think it killed Jed. Exhausted, she collapsed into his thick arms. Is it still in there now? She nodded. All right, you stay here. Prying her arms from his waist, he helped her stand on her own. Mitch stooped and picked up the shovel. I'll go check the house. 
But you can't leave me here, she begged as she felt her sense of security slip away. It'll be safer out here. It'll only take a minute. Gripping his makeshift weapon, Mitch stalked toward the house. As she watched her boyfriend disappear behind a mottled curtain of white, Clara realized that she couldn't stand the cold any longer. He said his truck was just up the way, she remembered. I could just sit inside until he comes back. Trudging ahead, she nearly missed the truck entirely. Mitch had backed up to the workshop's massive double doors. How long has he been home, she wondered, as she brushed her arm through the thick coating of snow that had collected on the pickup's hood. As she watched it flutter to the ground, she noticed something else. Besides her own, there were two sets of tracks leading from the shed to the driveway. The larger set obviously belonged to Mitch. Mingled with these, however, was a much smaller set. Stooping, she fingered a track, tracing the five little indents that resembled toes. From the direction of the house, something screamed. Her stomach nodded. She turned, walked slowly to the door, grabbed the metal handle with stiff fingers, and dragged it open. The building exhaled, its breath reeked of meat with a hint of kerosene. Tears freezing to her cheeks, she stepped inside. Just inside the door, a small heater burned, its coil glowed a dull orange. Only then could she hear the muffled hum of the generator as it ran behind the shed. The shed's only source of light came from the small drop lamp that dangled from an overhead beam. Loose straw rustling beneath her steps, she crossed the shed, stopping at the back wall. Thick sheets of canvas festooned from the loft above, concealing the final few feet of the building. Clutching the end seam in her trembling hands, she gave it a sharp tug. The canvas slipped free and puddled to the ground. Stepping back, Clara covered her mouth, her scream imploding in her chest. Clara had found her wraiths. Tied to the wall, their white, bloodless limbs mottled with cuts and bruises, were several women. Clara didn't need to touch the bodies to realize that they had frozen stiff. A small card table stood just before the grotesque shrine. Among the various tools and implements lies something a little more organic, a severed tongue. Mitch had been working late, but not at the garage. Oh, Clara. Clara wheeled. Mitch stood in the doorway, his beefy frame heaving. An angry set of scratches ran across his face. You know, you really weren't supposed to see this. That girl! Taken care of. Of course, she's in no kind of shape to be of any use to me. Raising the shovel, he thrust it into the light. Bright red blood dripped from the spade. No, Clara said as she realized she had doomed the woman. The poor girl hadn't been trying to attack her. She had come to Clara seeking help. I think that I found my replacement, though. With Mitch blocking the door, she was trapped. Please, she cried. That's it, Mitch cajoled. I love it when... Pausing, his expression flickered from triumph to terror. Following his gaze, Claire turned. Glassy eyes bulging from sunken sockets, the dead women ogled their killer. Oh, Jesus, no, Mitch said. Jaws dropping, mouths opening to inhuman angles, the victims wailed in chorus. Their voices melded together in a deafening harmony that shredded the senses with its otherworldly timber. Around them, the building shuddered from the volume. Clara sobbed as she covered her ears. She recognized the sound, had heard it many times. Shut up, Mitch screamed back as he winced in agony. Raising the shovel, he rushed. Lifting her hands in defense, Clara shifted to the side. Her move proved unnecessary as Mitch charged past. With a feral cry, he buried the spade deep into the corpse's chest. Wrenching the weapon free, he struck another one in the head. Undaunted, the corpses continued their tortured chorus. While Mitch pummeled the bodies, Clara sprinted to the doorway. Pausing at the kerosene heater, she gave it a kick. It tipped over, spilling fuel and enkindling the dry straw. Stepping back into the treacherous night, Clara shot a glance back. Trapped behind a glowing wall of fire, Mitch howled as he continued to hack away at the screaming wall of bodies. As the fire engulfed the building, Clara struggled down the driveway. She didn't stop, even after she lost her slippers. Pain radiated up from her bare feet, slowing her pace to a slow limp. Wind whistling through her ears, Clara didn't hear the approaching siren at first. Vision blurred, she strained to see the twirling red and blue lights as they cut through the snow and gloom. It can't be, she thought as she reached out. Trying to avoid her, the police cruiser skidded off the road. Clara collapsed onto her knees. Jesus, ma'am, the young officer said as he climbed from the car. I almost hit you. Rushing to her side, he lifted her up and assisted her to the back of his car. Was that you who called earlier? As the officer continued to question her, Clara didn't answer. Climbing into the back of the cruiser, Clara noticed her reflection in the car's rearview mirror. Snow-clumped blonde locks dangled in slick tendrils around her thin face 
and her full blue lips contrasted with her ivory skin. Eyes bulging from their puffy, purplish sockets, Clara screamed. <laughs>